For the source of this presentation, please go to the YouTube video, Noam Chomsky, The Machine, The Ghost, and the Limits of Understanding, as given at the University of Oslo in September of 2011. Dr. Chomsky approved this visualization of his ideas by me on Canada Day, 1st of July, 2016. I am grateful for his permission and hope to help illuminate and share his clear and insightful ideas. These images are available on Flickr as Noam Chomsky Visualization 1 to 21 under a Creative Commons license. Professor Olav Jelsvik director of the Center for the Study of Mind in Nature at the University of Oslo, introduced Professor Noam Chomsky as follows. He is the most quoted writer in academia alive, no comparison at all, with anybody else. It is fair to say he is the number one public intellectual in the world today. This presentation will introduce the substantial, if indirect, contributions that Isaac Newton made to the study of mind. A common view holds that the early scientific revolution provided humans with limitless explanatory power, and that this conclusion was later confirmed by Darwin's theory of evolution. A corollary is the common ridicule of what philosophers call Mysterianism. The idea of Mysterianism is commonly ridiculed today. The idea that there are mysteries in nature about which we will always be ignorant. The key figures of the scientific revolution did not ridicule Mysterianism. They accepted it. David Hume, in his chapter on the scientific revolution from the history of England, describes Newton as the greatest and rarest genius that ever arose for the ornament and instruction of the species. Hume concluded that Newton's greatest achievement was that although he seemed to draw the veil from some of the mysteries of nature, he showed, at the same time, the imperfections of the mechanical philosophy and thereby restored nature's ultimate secrets to that obscurity in which they ever did, and ever will, remain. The mechanical philosophy was the guiding doctrine of the scientific revolution. Inspired by clocks, machines that replicated digestion, or talking machines in the royal gardens made by skilled artisans, as some are by programmed computers today, the thinkers of the day embraced the mechanical philosophy in order to dispense of occult notions, such as the forms flitting through the air, or the sympathies and antipathies of the previous scholastic tradition, it wanted to be hard-headed and grounded in common-sense understanding, and it provided the criterion for intelligibility for Galileo, to Newton, and indeed well beyond. Descartes was believed to have explained the world in such mechanical terms, while also demonstrating that such explanations are not all-encompassing. They do not reach into the domain of mind in his view. He therefore postulated a new principle to account for what was beyond the reach of the mechanical philosophy. It accords with scientific method, though it is sometimes ridiculed. Descartes cast the postulate in terms of substance theory and formulated the mind-body problem to show how the mechanical and the mind might interact. Newton shattered the mechanical philosophy and with it went the understanding of the world that the scientific revolution sought to make clear. The mind-body problem also disappeared, and it has not truly been resurrected to this day. These ideas were well understood in the centuries that followed, even though they have been largely forgotten today. John Locke came to much the same view as David Hume, he was exploring the nature of our ideas, and he recognized that, according to the mechanical philosophy, only physical contact can result in producing motion. 
The mechanistic view of the world that Newton exploded saw the universe as a big clock-like object that we could fully explore and understand. In this mechanistic view, motion could only be caused by the collision of one physical object with another. This is also our common sense notion. Modern research in cognitive science supports Locke by indicating that this common sense idea is in large part genetically determined. Young infants recognize causality as being due to contact. These are the limits of our common sense. Newtonian gravitational attraction goes beyond our common sense. A child, if he or she perceives motion, will look for a physical contact as the cause. This is the limit of our common sense understanding. This is very much as Locke described. Causality is only recognized as being due to contact. The occult ideas of the scholastics or of Newtonian attraction are unintelligible by the criteria of the scientific revolution. Very much like Hume, Locke concluded that we remain in incurable ignorance of what we desire to know about matter and its effects. No science of bodies is within our reach. Locke added that we could only appeal to the arbitrary determination of all wise God, who made the world in a manner far above the limits of our weak understanding to conceive. Galileo reached much the same conclusions near the end of his life. He realized that his ideal, the mechanical philosophy, had failed to account for cohesion, attraction, and other phenomena. He was forced to reject the vain presumption of understanding everything, and concluding that there is not even a single effect in nature such that an ingenious theorist can arrive at a complete understanding of it. Descartes, though more optimistic, reached much the same conclusion as Galileo regarding the limitations of our thinking. He was not consistent on the matter. Rule 8 of the Reguli reads, If in the series of subjects to be examined, we come to a subject to which our intellect cannot gain a good enough intuition, we must stop there, and we must not examine the other matters that follow, but must refrain from futile toil. Specifically, Descartes speculated that we may not have understanding enough to understand the workings of the human mind. René Descartes stated that we may not have intelligence enough to understand the workings of the mind as in the case of language, a main concept for him. He came to realize that language has what has come to be known as a creative aspect. Every human being, but no beast or machine, has this capacity to use language in ways that are appropriate to situations, but not caused by them, a crucial difference, and to formulate and express thoughts that maybe are entirely new, and to do so without bound, may be incited or inclined to speak in certain ways by internal and external circumstances, but not compelled to do so. This was a mystery for Descartes, and remains a mystery for us. It quite clearly is a fact. Descartes continued that even if the explanation of our creative use of language and other examples of free and coherent forms of action lay beyond our cognitive grasp, as it apparently does, that is no reason to question the authenticity of our experience. Quite generally, he said, that free will, which is at the core of this creative capacity, is the noblest thing we have, and there is nothing we comprehend more evidently or perfectly, so it would therefore be absurd to doubt something we comprehend and experience so intimately within ourselves, namely that the free actions of human beings are undetermined. Like Locke, Descartes saw divine ordination 
as the dramaturge responsible for the apparent conflict between free will and causality. One scholar notes that by adopting the mechanical philosophy, Galileo had forged a new model of intelligibility for humankind, with new criteria of intelligible accounts of phenomena. So for Galileo, real understanding requires a mechanical model, a device that an artisan could construct, at least in principle, and hence intelligible to us. Galileo rejected current ideas about tides because we cannot duplicate them by means of appropriate artificial devices. His great successors adhered to these high standards of intelligibility and explanation. So it is therefore understandable why Newton's discoveries were so stridently resisted by the greatest scientists of the day. Christian Huygens described gravity as an absurdity. Gottfried Leibniz charged that Newton was introducing occult ideas similar to the sympathies and antipathies of the much ridiculed scholastic science, as he was offering no physical explanation for phenomena of the material world. It is important to note that Newton very largely agreed. Newton wrote that the notion of action at a distance is inconceivable. It's so great an absurdity that I believe no man who knows philosophical matters and has a confident faculty of thinking can ever fall into it. Philosophical for Newton meant what we mean by scientific. Newton conceded that we do not understand the phenomena of the material world. Action at a distance, or gravity, could not be understood in mechanical terms. Newton could not find a physical cause for gravity. He famously said, I frame no hypotheses. Newton defended himself from the charge that he was reverting to the mysticism of the Aristotelians. He argued that his principles were not occult, only their causes were occult. So, in his words, to derive general principles inductively from phenomena and afterwards to tell us how the properties of actions of all corporeal things follow from these manifest principles would be a very great step in philosophy, in science. Newton's laws describing the workings of gravity were not occult, but only their principles were occult, unknown, or possibly unknowable. Newton commented that an understandable account of gravity had not yet been discovered. With the word yet, he may have indicated a hope or expectation that it would become understandable in time, but 20th century science dashed the hope of us ever knowing nature in a true or accurate form. The best we can do is to develop intelligible theories of the world. Intelligibility is today dismissed as absurd, as Newton knew. A purely mechanical material description by science of nature was proven to be fruitless by Newton. The mechanistic ideas that have reigned since Galileo has a corollary when mechanical explanation fails understanding fails. So Newton's absurdities were finally, over time, simply incorporated into the common sense natural science that we study in school today. But that is quite different from common sense understanding. To put it differently, one long-term consequence of the Newtonian revolution was to lower the standards of intelligibility for natural science. Our hope to understand the world, which did motivate the modern scientific revolution, was finally abandoned. It was replaced by a very different and far less demanding goal, namely to develop intelligible theories of the world. As further absurdities, such as curved space-time and quantum indeterminacy, were absorbed into the natural sciences, the very idea of intelligibility was dismissed as itself absurd. 
Paul Dirac, in a well-known introduction to quantum mechanics, wrote that physical science no longer seeks to provide pictures of how the world works, that is, a model functioning on essentially classical lines, but only seeks to find a way of looking at the fundamental laws which makes their self-consistency obvious. So we understand the theories, but we have given up trying to understand the world. He was referring to the incredible conclusions of quantum physics, but if modern thinkers hadn't forgotten the past, he could have just as well have been referring to the classical Newtonian models, which undermined the hope of ever rendering natural phenomena understandable, the primary goal, the animating spirit of the early scientific revolution. In the classic 19th century philosophical account of materialism, originally in German, The History of Materialism and Critique of its Present Importance by Friedrich Albert Lange, Lange observes that we have so accustomed ourselves to the abstract notion of forces, or rather to a notion hovering in a mystic obscurity between abstraction and concrete comprehension, that we no longer find any difficulty in making one particle of matter act upon another without immediate contact, through void space, without a material link. The great scientists, philosophers, and mathematicians of the 17th century were far removed from this abstract notion of forces. They maintained that concrete contact was a condition of influence. This transition was one of the most important in the history of materialism, as it deprived the notion of much significance, if any at all. And with materialism goes the notion of the physical, of body, and other counterparts. They have no real significance. Lange notes with irony that what Newton understood as an absurdity is now taken to be his great discovery, the harmony of the universe via gravity. In 1927, Bertrand Russell stated that chemical laws cannot at present be reduced to physical laws. Linus Pauling soon showed that chemical laws will never be reduced to physical laws. The idea of physical laws is erroneous. Philosophers refer to this as the perceived explanatory gap, and the gap has never been filled since Newton first exploded the fictitious mechanical model. Bohr's model of an atom, one many of us learned about at school, is only an instrumental interpretation, a calculating device with no physical reality. In new biology, the idea that minds are emergent properties of brains, though emergences produced by principles that we do not yet understand, may be recapitulating errors from the 1930s in chemistry when it was believed that chemical laws would someday be reduced to physical laws. Hume asserted that we may look forward to unifications in science, but not reduction. This is a much weaker goal. Human explanatory power is not only limited, but does not even reach to the most elementary phenomena of the physical world. We are reduced to simply finding intelligible theories. The theory of evolution places humans firmly within the natural world, accounting humans as biological organisms, much like others. For every such organism, its capacities have scope and limits. They go together, and this includes the cognitive domain. So those who accept Darwin's theory should also accept Mysterianism, as Mysterianism follows naturally from everything we scientifically believe about human beings rooted in the organic world. The common ridicule of this concept, right through all theory of mind, would seem to paint humans as angels, exempt from biological constraints. Rats cannot solve prime number mazes. 
A problem falls within the cognitive range of an animal. A mystery falls outside of the cognitive range of an animal. What is a mystery for rats is not so for us, but human cognitive capacities also have limits. We have problems and mysteries too, and science, working away at the edges of the known and finding hard problems there, may establish the boundary between human problems and mysteries. If there were no limit to human understanding, then there would also be no scope. A human embryo has the capacity to grow into a human being, and not a mouse or amoeba. The same holds true in our cognitive domain. As artists know, with no rules or constraining boundaries, there can be no creativity. Charles Pierce applied evolutionary theory in observing that major discoveries in science are often made independently and at about the same time. It appeared to him that some inherent principles seemed to be guiding human inquiry, like the typical pattern that all children show in coming to terms with experience, including the systematic pattern of child language development, making sense of messy reality that booming, buzzing confusion, as William James put it. Pierce called this an abductive instinct that sets a limit on admissible hypotheses so that only certain explanatory schemes can be entertained but not infinitely many others, all compatible with available data, as Hume also believed. Pierce argued that this instinct developed through natural selection, but this argument is completely untenable. The serious and challenging problem remains for thinkers today to determine the innate components of our shared cognitive nature. Children uniformly make astounding discoveries about the world, ones that go far beyond mere data analysis. In the case of language, it is now known that this starts even before birth. A child is born with some conception of what counts as a language and can distinguish the language of its mother from another language it has never heard before spoken by another woman. Even the first step of language acquisition, which is generally taken for granted, is really quite an achievement. An infant has to select from the environment the data that are language-related. This is a task that is a mystery for any other organism, but is a reflexively solved problem for human infants. Pierce believed that our ability to do science, the abductive instinct, is acquired by natural selection, but this belief is completely unsustainable. If you drop it, as we must, we are left with a serious and challenging problem for science, namely, to determine the innate components of our cognitive nature. A different creature, say a Martian, might regard human mysteries as simple problems, just as we wonder about the problem of rats to run prime number mazes, not a mystery to us. So Newton's remarkable achievements led to a significant lowering of the expectations of science, a severe restriction on the role of intelligibility, and they furthermore demonstrated that it is an error to ridicule what is called the ghost in the machine. It is an error to ridicule the ghost in the machine. Newton did not exercise the ghost, rather he exercised the machine, and left the ghost intact, and so incidentally Newton set the study of mind on a new course, making it possible to integrate the study of mind within science. Newton may very well have realized this. What Newton called spirit, which is something he could not identify, might be the cause of all movement, including the power of moving bodies by thoughts, both human and animal. Is all matter alive? Locke stated that we cannot say that matter does not think. 
we cannot reject this possibility because of the limitations of our thinking. We still have no concept for what the physical is. The brain is a special organ designed to create thought, just as the digestive system is designed to digest food. The brain makes coherent the booming, buzzing confusion, as William James put it. The brain takes sense data and experience and creates from it an idea. The mind secretes thought. We cannot understand it, but simply accept it as true, in the same way as we must accept gravity without understanding the how of it, as Newton had illuminated the mind-body idea is unformulated because we still do not have a coherent theory of body, the physical, and material. Joseph Priestley concluded in the 18th century that properties termed mental reduce somehow to the organic structure of the brain, an idea he developed in quite interesting ways, an idea stated in simpler words by Hume, Darwin, and many others, and an idea that seems inescapable after the collapse of the mechanical philosophy. Nativism in philosophy refers to the belief that certain concepts are native, or in the brain from birth, what we would call genetic endowment. Hume is the arch-materialist, but also a nativist, two positions often held to be opposed, but he had to be because he was reasonable. The work suggested by Hume to determine human cognitive capacity had been undertaken by British Neoplatonist philosophers, work that influenced Kant. This is called the naturalization of philosophy, or epistemology naturalized, or sometimes just cognitive science. It is a direct consequence of Newton's demolishing are ever being able to grasp the physical nature of the world. It is fair to conclude that the hopes and expectations of the early scientific revolution were dashed by Newton's discoveries. One conclusion, reinforced by Darwin, is that while our cognitive capacities may be vast in scope, they are nevertheless intrinsically limited. Some questions that we may like to explore may well be beyond our cognitive reach. We may not even be able to formulate the right questions. The standards of success in science may have to be lowered again, as happened very dramatically before, when Newton's ideas caused the collapse of mechanical philosophy. Another conclusion is that the mind and body problem can safely be put to rest since there is no coherent alternative to Locke's suggestion. This opens the way to the study of mind as a branch of biology, much like the rest of the body. Many of the early leading questions of the scientific revolution have never been answered and may never be.